All right. Hello, hello, everyone. It's very good to be uh, back at, uh, at Slush. There was such a great uh, vibe here. So I'm very happy to be here with a, a great uh, friend and also partner, uh, partner in crime, uh, Nicolas from, uh, from AMI. So no, thank you for, for joining me here. I think for all of you who don't speak French, maybe you might need subtitles because uh, <laughs> you, you'll have to deal with our heavy French accents, but uh, we'll do our best uh, to, uh, to, to make it clear. So, so Nicolas, uh, you're running AMI Paris. Uh, we're working together, so at Felix Capital, who is one of the investors, and I'm lucky to be uh, on the board of AMI. Uh, we've been following your journey for the past 10, 11 years that we've known each other. Um, so can you tell us about what brought you to this opportunity, what you know, got you into fashion first, um, and uh, what you saw first in AMI that made you join the, the brand and company so early on? So I came, so first, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I first joined fashion by chance because I wanted to find a job in New York. I graduated from a business school in Paris, and the first job I found in New York was in fashion, and that was in 2001. And since then, uh, I haven't uh, quitted fashion. To come back to your question about Ami Paris, it's uh, through a common friend who first helped Alexandre, Alexandre Matiussi, who was the designer and founder of Ami Paris. And a friend of mine helped him launch his company as a startup, I would say, and he was uh, back then uh, a business angel. And he called me and said, Nicholas, I've just invested in fashion for the first time. This guy was working in tech. He was doing like uh, solar panels. And he told me, can you give me uh, some advice or tell me what you think about the brand? I didn't know the brand at that time, so I went to see his first corner in a Grand Magasin in Printemps in Paris, and I totally fell in love with the, the mood, the atmosphere, the design. The salesperson was so happy, you know, he was smiling, he was proud to be part of it, and I kind of fell in love with the brand. I bought half of the corner, and uh, when I get back, I call my friend, I think, I think there is something here, I would love to meet the founder. And that's the way it all started. So at the time, it was a pretty small business. You joined from a relatively established and large, large company, which, uh, which had helped scale significantly. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about the, well, the, no, the size of the business at the, that time and compared to where it is today? Because the, the growth has been really spectacular. Uh, at that time, it was definitely a startup. It had like a year of activity. It was about uh, less than 1 million euro turnover. Uh, and uh, I was still uh, uh, managing the brand uh, The Couples, that at that time went quite big. Uh, and so it was less than 1 million euros, but I felt this guy that was really smart, that was talented. He has a very small team, so to give some figures, at that time he had eight employees, it was less than a million euros. To today we are more than 700 employees worldwide, and uh, we grew now with over 300 million euros. So it's it's not the same story, but it was the guy. The inspiration was the, the intuition that this guy was talented, that there was, a, I would say, a talent, capacity, a will to be big. When I first met with him, it was a, we were having a morito, and he told me, you know, Nicholas, I'm a designer, but I'm a commercial. Uh, my success is not to be only on the cover of Vogue magazine. My success is to see my garment worn in the street, on terrace of cafe, cinema, etc. So I like this idea of a guy that is balance that uh, is very creative, but it's still uh, uh, it's both, I would say, his mind in the cloud, but his feet on earth, and, uh, and that makes me uh, want to move and join him. And so the, the, the brand is very much rooted in you know, the European and French heritage in particular, yes. and, it, and we'll talk about the, you know, the, the cultural relevance of the brand. But you, very early, you saw an opportunity to expand um, outside of France, and I think it's very much uh, no, a, a, a conference here where we talk about growth, where we talk about uh, being ambitious, where we talk about co conquering the world um, and, uh, and thinking globally. So very early you saw the potential to take the brand outside of France, especially yes. in Asia, mm -hmm. which is um, not the, usually the first destination that people go after. So can you tell us about that and, and, and how that this journey take place? Yes. Uh Maybe to answer you, I will come back to my previous brand, uh, Couples, that we founded in 2008, and we developed very in a fast speed for five years. And the thing with Couples is we overdeveloped first in France, then in UK, but not globally. And that was my uh, the thing I wanted to do there. And my partners were not so agreeing with me that I was thinking at that time uh, Asia was a huge potential uh, development for European brands. 
And we didn't do it with couples. So when I joined uh, Ami, I told him, look, we are great in France. We see that uh, very early on we have this traction because the brand doesn't pretend to change fashion. We're doing like very, uh, I mean, quality clothes, good fabric, nice cut, but we're not doing crazy fashion forward thing, but we're trying to do the right quality with the right price and a storytelling that tells about the brand. Our only goal is to make people happy with the clothes they wear, nothing else. And we thought that, I mean, I thought, and Alexandre, I think, shares this value, is that what we proposed, talk to a guy in Paris, in Shanghai, in London, in New York. So it was very universal. And I told him, I think we should go quite fast to Asia because there is this, uh, this will to meet with young designer, uh, emerging brand that makes sense, that have their own designer behind the brand. That is not just a name, it's a guy behind the brand. So very early on, OK, now we're moving. Very early on, we opened the second store in Tokyo which was quite complicated. Then we opened in London, then in, uh, in Beijing, because even if it was much more difficult when we were small and we didn't have, such, we didn't have that much money, uh, I thought it was important to put some dots all around the emerging market, I mean, emerging fashion market we were targeting. So it would have been much more easier to open like uh, 20 stores in, in France or in Paris that we did with couples, but we kind of felt to make it possible to open the store in Asia, then store quite a lot of store in Europe, and then in the US. US is much more challenging for an independent brand, the CapEx, the OPEX, the staff, everything. So very early on, we, we had this idea in mind by wholesale, online, and retail to put dots all around the world, and then later on connecting those dots. So can you maybe give us to get a sense of the growth, the, uh, you know, some n numbers in terms of scale, the kind of growth you've experienced, uh, um, no, revenue, number of stores, or you know, that kind of growth matrix? Yes. Uh, I mean, at the beginning, Ami was nearly totally wholesale, because when you are a designer brand to reach a certain level, you need that brand environment, you need that level of volume for your production. Uh, but we started opening our own store. I mean, the first store was in December 12 in Paris. Then uh, in 14, we start to open abroad. And today, uh, our retail is more than 50% of our turnover. Uh, we have 73 stores. I would say about uh, uh, m most of them, 50 about are in Asia. We have about uh, 16 in, uh, in Europe and the rest in the US only. Uh, a few four or five stores for now in US, but we're gonna, uh, we're gonna develop a lot there. So we try to find this balance also because we don't have like LVMH occurring behind us. So uh, anytime there is a crisis like the pandemic, uh, a war whatsoever, we have to be balanced between regions, so Asia, Europe, and the US, but also between canals, between wholesale, retail, and online. So we've been trying to, to play an agility game between the, the region and the canals. And to come back to your question in terms of figures, so about 73 stores, uh, about 600 wholesale clients. Um, and in terms of turnover, we reached uh, 300 million euros last, last year in 2023. From a million when you joined? Uh, From a million in uh, 2013. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what's really interesting, I mean, that's very, very impressive growth. Um, that has also been done profitably. So yeah. you know, there is you no know, culture, obviously, requiring venture capital money to grow from many of the startups uh, mm -hmm. here at, at Slush. Um, but it's interesting when you sell a product where clearly there's a connection to an audience uh, where you don't have to overspend in marketing and mm -hmm. you have healthy gross margin, mm -hmm. you can grow uh, profitably and very strongly as well. So that has been the story of... Yeah, uh, it has been the key marker of our development. Uh, I told Alexandre, we're not here at the beginning to make money, we're here to develop a, a fashion brand, which takes a lot of money, mainly when you want to go retail. Uh, and the baseline was just to be balanced and then to be profitable. So how did we make it? We make it through partnership. We did partnership with big department store, with concept store. Then we did partnership with uh, Farfetch. We did uh, the black, black and white and FPS, the kind of delegation scheme for our website because we don't have the mean, we don't have the team. So we try to learn through partnership. And then when we see that the market is big enough, uh, we buy back our, either our distributor, our partner, uh, the agent we have in some markets. And now, for example, for the, um, the website, we just did the replatforming recently, 
and now we're working with Shopify to uh, operate our own website. Yeah. Talking about partnership, I've heard that um, one of your secret weapons to succeed in China in retail has yes. been uh, karaoke. <laughs> Do you want us to sing here? <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, No, it's, 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 it's only half a joke because I think... Yeah, no, no, I, I, do, I do think it's important. I think I wouldn't say you, are, you have to change the person you are or the brand you are depending on the market you want to, to develop in, but understanding the local culture, playing by the games, as long as you're consistent and true as a person, as a brand, it would help you go faster. And the, the, to be very transparent, uh, we had to find ways around because we have the money, we don't have the capex, So we have to be flexible, we have to be fun, we have to go fast, uh, we have to take some risk. We did take quite a lot of risk during the COVID. Uh, we did, uh, I can tell you, a big step. What I consider now as a big step is in 2019, uh, right before the COVID exploded in uh, China, we did our first fashion show abroad. Normally we do fashion show in Paris Fashion Week, so every six months. We did the first fashion show abroad in Shanghai. And uh, a month before the fashion show, Our partners, you know, we cannot finance a Chinese partner because we had a JV at that time. He said, we cannot finance, so either you can sell or you postpone the show. And we say, no way. It's the, the time we need to do it now. We cannot postpone. Hopefully, we didn't. Uh, and we did this fashion show in Shanghai in uh, October 19, 2019. So clearly a few weeks before the COVID. Because of this, it was a huge success. Before that, our fashion show, we had like 10,000, 20,000. 80,000 views, we reached a few million views for this first fashion show over there. And then when everything was locked down in Europe, when the, the COVID uh, touched uh, Paris, Europe and the US, when everything was frozen in Europe, because of the fashion show and the two stores were already open in China, we were able to open 11 stores in China and six in Korea uh, during the COVID. So I think it's through partnership to taking some risk. Then it's kind of... Maybe it can be a strategy, it can be a big part of chance as well, but taking this risk. Yeah, you talk about the importance of uh, kind of connecting to local culture, but uh, uh, AMI is very much rooted in the French culture. Yes. Um, and you know, at Felix, uh, we always see brands as communities, and we always talk about the importance of storytelling, mm -hmm. the importance of visual content. So that's something that AMI has been doing very well. You're very much rooted in, in storytelling and community. Yes. So can you expand on you know, how that has been a lever for growth and how you've managed to create that uh, very live community that's uh, loved the brand, yes. that's present across the world? Uh, uh, I mean, this is where maybe uh, Alexandre, who's a designer, and me as the manager, we really meet. We like people. It's very easy. We like people. So for example, when we decided to move to China and to open our first store over there, I asked Alexandre, I said, please, I want you to come. I'm a I, was, I had big conviction in China, like I told you earlier. I told me, Alexandre, you, I, I suggest you come with me, but let's not go to Beijing or Shanghai. Let's go to, to Chengdu, to Ningbo, to Hainan, to, to places you don't know. Let's have dinner with chef, DJ, architect, local designer, and let's learn from them. Not to change our speech. It has to be a consistent speech. You cannot play different, uh, different songs depending on the market, but we learn a lot through that. We make real friendship. No matter it's in the US, uh, I mean, coming here, I'm doing great meeting in, uh, in Helsinki, and just to learn from these people. And when you add to the business this kind of relationship, first you learn more, uh, then you have amazing opportunity that you will never get through normal uh, brand development. And we call it family, which is easy with uh, Ami, uh, because I like to, to remind that Ami means friend. It means friend, and uh, when we talk about a family, it's an inclusive family. You choose the friend you have, you don't choose your own family. So this is the, the idea of family. is not being too, uh, too crazy about, like Alexandre says, say, I don't do a trill expense, but I do quality garment with quality fabrics. And also, I think an important point about our development and the respect of this, uh, this family is to propose prices that are totally in line with the quality. We produce in the same factory as Zenia, Prada, etc., but we don't retail at the same price. We didn't go crazy during the COVID. We didn't raise our price by 40 or 60%. So we used to be just below the luxury, the full luxury brand. Now they, a lot of them went a little bit crazy from luxury to super luxury. So for us, we have a high way of development. And now I think people, uh, clients, they are more informed. They are more knowledgeable because of this. Sometimes they are more informed that you on sell staff. 
So I think respect is a big part of this family and this, uh, this development. So you've managed to create some, some important moments for the brands uh, and creating more cultural relevance, yes. uh, connecting to um, people in a more creative way. Mm? So what happened with Emily in Paris, for instance, <laughs> where some, uh, somehow the, I had a few people here mentioning uh, I mean, the yeah. brand and, and because they discovered the brand through Emily in Paris. Uh -huh. And so how did that connection happen? That connection happened when they launched, before they launched Emily in Paris season one, they saw what we did, the artists we were dressing, etc. So they contacted us, the production contacted us, asking some uh, garments. So we did it. We didn't have the logo at that time, so we lent them some uh, clothes for the first season when Emily was not known. And then when it grew, we kept this connection, this friendly connection. And finally, it was at the end of season three with the balloon, the love is in the air thing, that we did a real partnership. And uh, my conviction through this example is we first built connection, friendship, and then we had business, and then we had money, and not the other way around. And then for the, the fourth season, the beginning, uh, it was fun because on the third season, many people thought that it was a fake brand. It was just for the, mm. the, the, the Emily, the, the series, the Netflix series. And then we said, maybe if we do something else, we have to tell who we are. And they made a kind of surprise for us. We didn't see the fourth season episode. And it was the very first episode that they displayed in uh, mid-August. So that was fun to see it all around. We had like huge, many fun calls. And uh, so you see, it's a long term. It's not just a one uh, marketing yeah. and thing. And it was very authentic in that it, sense. It was the brand. Yeah. Yeah. Just like your logo. In fact, the logo is also very authentic because it wasn't it like Alexandre, the designer's it, It's more than a logo. It's a, it's a symbol because we were wondering ourselves with Alexandre because we did like eight years without any logo. We had kind of signature element, but no logo. And we were thinking about it. And one day he called me, just from his office to mine, he said, Nicholas, I've got an ID. He said, why don't we use this? It was his own signature since he was a kid. And even in the studio, when he loved a design and he was validating a garment, he did a stamp with this logo, so with this signature. So he said, let's try, let's give it a go. That was 2018 winter fashion show. And he put it on the fashion show, where normally you don't do so because has, logo is more linked to commercial thing that you mm. don't display in the, on the catwalk and he did the closing of the fashion show on the toit, like a uh, ceiling of Paris, and uh, that made a huge success, even more during the COVID, because during COVID, people were not wearing like jackets or shirts, but they were wearing knitwear during the winter, hoodies during the summer. And from that time, uh, in 2019, when he reached the market, the, the turnover totally exploded. But at the same time, I think we have to be cautious, because when the logo is present everywhere, it can be damaging for the brand. So now you see we try to switch from this to this, a little more uh, discreet, turn on turn, so that also people can wear it at, uh, at work, at the office. And so Slush is very much about uh, celebrating founders as well. Yes. Uh, so founders coming from all over Europe and way, way beyond. Um, you're working with a founder, I mean, you're quite a like co-founder at this point, having been there for such a, a, a long time. Yeah, but you are working with a creative founder. Um, so how, how is, does it work? Because we've seen many of the greatest brands in the world are, are usually the, the result of the association with a great designer, with a great you know, business person next mm -hmm. to him. We saw had Yves Saint Laurent, Pierre Berger, there were many of those uh, stories. So how, how is it to work with a creative and how do you... Uh, leave each other in of space. And clearly, it's been a very successful partnership over the mm -hmm. past 12 years. 12 years um, yes. And you've both grown tremendously with the business. So um, how does that partnership work? How is it different from a mm -hmm. business to business no, I think partnership? That's an interesting question, because it's always a kind of, uh, it's a, a balance that you have, a moving balance, I would say, that you have to find. And it's not easy. It's not always like uh, straight. Uh, but I think it's built out of respect. With Alexandre, we've been working together for 12 years, but we're not close friends. We don't see each other too much outside of work because we want to keep this distance. And I would say maybe the main point is uh, trust and respect so that uh, I'm in charge of business, is in charge of image. We have each of us have his own field, but we're trying not to force the other one. If there is any business decision, uh, I don't manage to convince him we, we talk and I, I don't go forward. The same thing, if artistically speaking, he wants to do something that I don't understand, he's not forcing me, he's trying to explain me. So we've been always taking care, trying to take care of this balance. Say, if we're not strong or clear enough to explain to the other one, it means that it's not a good decision. 
So it's a question of, they are up and down, but we try, I think the key element is communication. And sometimes, you know, we wanted to go too fast, we're just talking between two meetings and it didn't work. And we, 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 we work with a coach, with advisors, to try and find the balance and also building up a strong team behind us now because we're much bigger today and uh, we can't handle everything, the two of us. Sounds like a lot of no common sense as well and advice people would give to a couple as well. Mm. Communication being the... Uh, yeah, it's like a couple, it's uh, a business and especially couple. With very, very people with very different uh, yes. skill set and personalities. Yeah. Yes. And so where, I mean, today, obviously, it's, uh, it's been a challenging environment post-COVID for you know, consumer luxury in general. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, has been, uh, AMI has continued to, to grow and to do uh, very well. So at this point, you're, you know, the brand is 14 years in, has, got, has really got scale. Mm -hmm. You're 12 years in personally. Um, what's the you know, future of AMI? What are the gross levers today? Uh, and then we can talk more, more broadly. How do you see the evolution of retail? Uh, Uh, so, I will answer in two parts. First about Ami, then about retail. Ami, uh, like I was explaining, is trying to shift to a D2C model so that we can be really uh, the driving our own development, not depending on either partners or wholesale uh, um, partners. So, the idea is to open our own store, uh, to go direct to uh, nearly all the markets. In terms of regions, I think we have a big way to go in the US and in Middle East. Uh, we, are, we have only three flagship stores in the US and no real flagship store in the Middle East for now. So we are in discussions to go faster. Um, if you think of the US, do you think you could open, you have a number of stores you could open there potentially? A lot. Yeah. I think if there are two things. First, the US, if you talk about East Coast and West Coast, is like quite an, not an easy, but a p possible game for European brand. Then if you really want to, to develop inside the US, it's a different story. You have to work with big department store, with trendy uh, concept store. So it's a, it's a long-lasting work. We've been working with PR, events, athletes, etc. But it's a, huge, it's a huge market. It's a demanding market. But I think now, after the election, etc., they, they have this capacity to, to rise again. And uh, I think in China, it's more complicated now. But it's a good time for young, I mean young. I keep on saying young, we're not that young. We're like a teenager now. But there are still a lot of opportunities. Some brands stop everything there. I don't think it's a move. We have to make smart choices, but to keep on building our presence because there's a huge clientele for our brand over there. And then talking, coming back to your question more widely about, uh, about fashion, I think fashion or fashion brand had to, to give more than garments. Now people are aware, they want to know where you build, where you, you produce your garment, who's behind the brand, how do you live, are you consistent? I think you have to be... Uh, 360 consistent. The speech you give to your client in a marketing way, it has to be consistent with the way you treat your own uh, staff, with the way you treat your partners. You know, during COVID, we had strong talk with our partners saying, okay, what can we do? How much can we stop? How much can we delay? And um, I think we have to keep the, the telescope vision and not the microscope vision. So we are quite ambitious about the development of AMI. I think because of this... Uh, luxury brand going super luxury and going totally crazy about prices. We have a, quite a good opportunity, market opportunity, to develop a brand, to open our own stores in like a strong market, developing market, and, uh, and we're excited. We're still very excited about and, the brand. And offering uh, experiences as well, because I saw there is a, I saw an, um, a reference uh, online to a Ami Paddle uh, yeah. In Miami? Uh, yes. In Miami, I saw uh, a new cafe you're doing in, in China. So you, uh, you yeah, expect to have more of right. these unexpected... Uh, well, we try, you know, maybe to finish on this point, it's been, I mean, the brand has been nearly 13 or 14 years. I've been there for 12 years. We still want to have fun. And I think if we're excited about what we do, it's the best way to keep on moving and, and building this brand. So we're doing now this kind of lifestyle cafe. We have a pop-up in Tokyo, Motesando right now. We opened yesterday a, a paddle collaboration in Miami Design District called La Reserve, which is working really well. Uh, we have a few upcoming projects, so we like to experiment. And like I was telling you, to take some risk, to surprise the client and to surprise ourselves. So we like to have fun. Okay, well, thank you. On this note, I think we can wrap the, the discussion. And thank you very much, Nicolas. And uh, let's continue to have fun and to grow yes. AMI. Uh, I think we're on a great, great trajectory. Thank and, uh, you for the, the uh, invitation. I can't wait yes. to see the first AMI store in Helsinki then. 
<laughs> Maybe you. we have to work on it. And thank, thank you. you to Back a Story because he's both an investor and a friend, and I think that's a, a good wrap-up for this talk. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Thank you.